Here's the thing. Starbucks is a name that's become synonymous with coffee. Just uh, everyone is, and to quote a very good friend of mine, you don't even have to like coffee. A lot of people just like the idea of coffee. So how did it all begin? Just I know people see them everywhere and try to figure out how everything happened. Originally, Starbucks was originally, the idea of it originally was founded actually in a, a love for coffee. Was There was a guy named Albert Pete. He actually was in San Francisco. How Albert just really had a love for different coffees all over the world, which we now think about, and that's not a big deal. I mean, you understand, you know, a lot of people understand there's Sumatran coffee and there's African coffee, and they all have different tastes and such. But back in those days, it was it was all Folgers or it was all Maxwell House, which were probably grown in Colombia, but I'm not really sure. Uh, well, Albert, what he did was he just shared his love of coffee with everyone he had. He really had a um, he would share it and share just the romance and the excitement of just all these different types of just how intricate something so simple that we're used to on an everyday basis can be. There's three guys, one guy named Jerry, another guy named Gordon, another guy named Zev, uh, all about that. So they actually ended up going off to Seattle, and while they are in Seattle, they started a business, a business that um, just was a small business. A small business, it was a small business from 1971. 1986-87. They named it uh, Starbucks. Now they named it not because of any specific thing having to do with coffee, but one of the gentlemen at the time was reading the book Moby Dick. So, and if you've ever read Moby Dick, which I haven't, I just have the book, <laughs> you would know that the first mate in Moby Dick is called Starbuck. So that's apparently where the name came from. Just another small company knowing what they do to do. Well, there's a guy who's a small, low-level executive, very young, very advanced for his age, in New York. Grew up in New York, was originally from New York, very much an East Coast guy. His name is Howard. So, his real name is Howard. His full name is Howard Schultz. But we can call him Howie. Howard, what he did was he actually went on to, he was, he was going through all these inventories, and he saw there was this little company that sold coffee out in Seattle that would buy one particular type of coffee maker at such a rate that it was even greater than Macy's, the entire chain of Macy's. So he was very interested in this and trying to figure out why would they do this. So he went out and through a long series of events, he ends up becoming part, um, ends up coming on even as, a, as just a low level uh, working in the store person. Because you have to imagine, you have to think of Starbucks not as the great thing, the huge thing that we know it as, Think of it as the Curly's Frozen Yogurt place right up the road, which I'd love to go to. My wife does, too. But just a little place that all the people here locally probably knew for 10, 15. I don't know how long Curly's been there, probably longer than that. So but it was just a small local business. He began working there. He wanted to be in charge of their marketing, which these three guys just weren't really sure about the marketing. They just opened up a small business. They just really enjoyed that aspect of it. So what ends up happening is, is he works there and just... Uh, Starbucks only sold whole beans at the time. They didn't do the whole espresso stuff. That came a lot later. Uh, they would just sell whole beans. They wouldn't even sell cups of coffee. They just would sell people beans. Occasionally, they'd have a tasting here and there so people can understand that coffee grown in different places in the world actually has different flavors. Uh, then what happened was is Howard went on a trip with his wife to Venice. As he's walking around Venice, he sees all these baristas, these guys who are in these little coffee shops along the way, and they know every single person who's walking in. They're having conversations with them. They're making drinks for them as they're doing this. And he sees this and just is like, this is amazing. He saw how the, how the interaction was going. He saw people were just having great conversations off to the side with the barista. That was just a very different, there was a culture around that. And he really saw that this was something very good. Well, what happened is Howard came back, and they actually, Starbucks tried the whole espresso thing, and it was a huge success. Now, but there's three owners, if we went back to the original part of the story, and a couple of them, they, they decided this really wasn't a direction that they wanted to go. So Howard really was sold on the idea of espresso and really selling that to people. So he started up his own company. It's all El Giordano. It means the daily. So what happened was, is this business was... He actually left Starbucks and opened up, started this brand new company. Things began going well. So previous to Howard being there, what had happened was is there was actually a, uh, there's, this was the logo of Starbucks and for the longest time. It was, a, it was a brown siren. It's not a mermaid. Don't tell any Starbucks person it's a mermaid. They'll, they'll correct you. Uh, but no, it was just a small, mer just a, a logo that was there. 
So it is, I almost said Mermaid. Didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so what ends up happening is, is, is Howard goes on, and what ends up in Starbucks comes to a point where they decide they want to they want to say. So Howard knows the culture of Starbucks, knows the thing that these guys did, and he says this is really good. So he buys it and he merges it with the company El Giordano. Now, what they did was the company of El Giordan would actually had a round logo as well. It was kind of greenish and white, and there was something funny looking in the middle. So he actually created this this one right here. So this is actually the Starbucks that we all know. And, you know, when you see this logo, you don't even, if I even took Starbucks off here, probably everybody in here would know exactly what this was. So what ends up happening is about 1987, Howard buys the company, and he began to, uh, he began to move out. Originally, originally Starbucks was only in Seattle and in British in Vancouver, British Columbia. First place they decided was Chicago would be a great market to open up. Not really the wisest idea if you would have looked over the entire market share, simply because Chicago is the home to Maxwell House. <laughs> so, which my wife is presently drinking, and I'm working on her with that. But that's a whole other story. But no, it's. Anyway, so it ends up taking off and ends up doing pretty good. Starbucks begins opening up locations in other places. One of the one of the earlier stores in the history of the company actually is in Fort Worth. It's the Camp Bowie store, the one on Camp Bowie near Brian Earl. It's, it's probably one of the I don't know the exact number of the store, but it's it's a newer store than I think just about any other one of the metro blocks. So Starbucks expands about 1992, um, and as they expanded, they they of course were going with the idea of espresso and baristas, and the, the thing that Howard saw when he was in Venice was he saw this thing that that was, no one was really capitalizing on, this idea of a third place. A third place is a is kind of an idea of, first you have your work, and you have your home, but you needed some place to kind of get to know some place where everyone knows your name, so to speak, kind of like Cheers. At, at different points in history, it's been bars and, and other places like that, and there was, he just didn't see there was a place where people were able to relate and have a third place. So Starbucks is really best thing that, they're able, that they actually help people with more than anything is actually the third place, even more than coffee. That's actually their niche. So around, as things transition, as they always do, around, two, around the year 2000, Howard moved out and actually moved off to, uh, moved out of Starbucks because he wanted to move out and try some other things as well. So Jim Donald, a good friend of his, <coughs> or the, exec, the executive vice president, actually moves into the spot goes on a huge growth type thing. Just starts going. Growth, growth, growth. Well, the problem was is just there, the level of... Uh, there's just a lot of problems when you grow too fast. Many of you business guys here understand that a whole lot better than I do at present. Uh, when you grow too fast, you're not able to grow your leadership fast enough. You're not able to encourage those who need to be there. You're not able to keep the values that are, that are very important. So um, in 2008... Starbucks, uh, Howard came back to the company to try to save it again. Immediately he began growing the company and reinforcing some slipping standards, reforged the coffee culture, uh, and began closing some of the stores. And this happened right before uh, the economy began taking a little bit, a few different turns. So their timing actually was really good. So it was actually beginning to strengthen their foundation before that happened. The future of Starbucks is, is the question. It's unknown. At, at a time when people are looking for more and more value, and not as much of a luxury. People see Starbucks as a luxury. So it'll be really interesting. But I guarantee you they will continue to start keep brewing coffee, even if it gets all the way down to that last store, the first store, right there in Pike's Place Market in Seattle. They'll keep growing that coffee and sharing the love of coffee that Albert Pete originally shared with them with other people wherever they go.